last week we uh, finished a series about uh, Italian outstanding women in the US, but I think that tonight we should uh, uh, consider this conversation part of the series. We, in that series we had uh, uh, a scientist, uh, a chef, also a composer, Paolo Prestini, oh. Olivia, yeah, Olivia. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and and tonight we uh, have a conductor. Normally, we um, many people think that the conductor has to be man, but I I don't agree with this. Uh, and one of the reason is Peranza Scappucci because he's really. A, a great conductor. Um, Speranza Scapucci recently made a successful Vienna debut acclaimed by the public and critics uh, with La Traviata e la Cenerentola at the Vienna State Opera. In February 2017, she was the first female conductor to direct the orchestra in the orchestra in the annual Vienna Opera Ball. In March 2017, uh, Scapucci made her first appearance with the opera Royale de Valloni, based on her work in this production. In April 2017, the opera Royale de Valloni named her its new principal conductor, the first female conductor to hold this post, effective with the present season. She is considered uh, one of the most interesting conductors of her generation of the international sea. Uh, Speranza Capucci will be in conversation with uh, Hervé Sachs, and so please enjoy. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Is this working? I don't know. I think it is. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll tell you, I want to start with a little uh, story. This was about uh, eight or nine years ago um, when uh, Ricardo Muti was doing, um, there was a period when every year he did a series of concerts with the New York Philharmonic before he became the Chicago Symphony's principal conductor. And I've known Maestro Muti for many years, and so we used to, I used to go up into the dressing room before the rehearsal or you know, during the break, and we would uh, tell jokes and chit-chat and so on. And one time, um, I came into the room, and he introduced me to this person here, um, who uh, was one of his uh, musical assistants and helped him to prepare singers for in Salzburg and various places and so on. And then I went out into the auditorium to uh, follow the rest of the rehearsal and Speranza came along and wanted to share the score. I think it was the Frank D. Minor Symphony yeah. that he was conducting. And I thought, well, that's unusual for a rehearsal pianist to uh, want to follow the orchestra score of a, <laughs> of a piece that the Philharmonic is performing. And um, over the years, uh, my partner Eve Wolf, who's here this evening, and I became very friendly with Speranza. And uh, when she was invited to conduct uh, Così Fan Tutte at uh, Yale in, I think, 2012, we went up there, my son also, we were sort of a cheering squad, you know, uh, <laughs> that went up there to, to watch her. And we followed her career very uh, closely since then. And I must say, it's been an extraordinary rocket uh, up, up into the sky because uh, she's really done and, and continues to do extraordinarily well in a very short period of time. Um, so I would like to start uh, by asking, telling and asking uh, about the role of the 
uh, fido maestro sostituto, the, the musical assistant, the uh, repetiteur in opera companies, because this was traditionally the way in which uh, musicians became conductors. They worked first very closely with singers as assistants to experienced conductors and gradually began to take over uh, productions themselves. Because this is such uh, good training to, to work in the opera house, maybe you could talk a little bit about that from your own point of view. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful words and introduction. Uh, I remember that moment, actually, when we met in Meister's uh, dressing room. Um, I feel very lucky because um, my musical path, uh, my musical life has been very sort of out of the, what would be the normal path, you know. Uh, I, I never dreamed of becoming a conductor. Um, I was perfectly happy with my life as a pianist. As a soloist first, I did a lot of chamber music. When I came over to New York and the Juilliard, my main aim was, was to do chamber music. I knew that the best players were gonna be there. Um, and I was very lucky, the first day I, I got to Juilliard, we had auditions for different programs. And one of the things I signed up for immediately was Samuel Sanders' class. Um, Sam was, you know, doesn't need any introduction. He, amazing pianist, collaborative pianist, and uh, more than the solo piano, which of course what, what was what got me into Juilliard. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed the chamber music making, and and then finally I discovered this whole other chapter, which was vocal music. And coming from an Italian family, uh, growing up in Rome, my parents always brought me to the opera. Uh, I, I grew up, you know, bred in opera. <laughs> so, um, so all of a sudden I discovered the world of opera, the world of singing, and um, it became this like ardent passion to, to work with singers, uh, also because I speak many languages and, you know, that comes in handy also. And, um, and what I found is that during those years where, where I did that um, job of repetitor, I learned so much about music um, because I think that opera is is the greatest form that the, you know it's the most complete. You have theater, you have words, you have music, you have chorus, uh, you have the costumes, you know the wigs. <laughs> um, so, but that that knit knit you know work was is what gave me uh, a great background musically because. Uh, as you said, I was interested in the in the orchestral score, but that's also because at Juilliard, of course, and in Italy, where I did more than ten years of studies. Um, where where was that? Uh, in Santa Cecilia in Roma. We studied everything: score reading, uh, figured bass, uh, you know, all those things, and and those things come in handy when you're doing the job of a repetitor. I found myself at City Opera. One of my first gigs there as a pianist was to play. Le Nozze di Figaro, and they just threw me into the orchestra and say, play the, play the cembalo, and I was like, oh, you know. And then I thought about all the hours doing figured bass um, at Juilliard, uh, where I used to hate it. <laughs> I mean, I just didn't enjoy it as much. And then all of a sudden I'm there improvising on, on chords that are not even written on the music. And, um, and when, you do, when you do the rehearsal pianist thing, what happens is that you have to study the orchestral score. Because the way you play the piano when you're playing an opera is not the same as if you're playing uh, something written for the piano. You can add, you can... So it's very important to know, oh, the double bass is playing there, so therefore I'm gonna dig in more into the bass line. So um, doing about 15 years of that brought me from you know, a certain level to a really high level. Uh, working with people like Muti and Dubimeta and other people like that. And then finally, you just find yourself, without even wanting to, conducting. Because Maestro is not there, and all of a sudden you have to pick up the baton and do it. And, and it's something that I discovered that finally the, the gesture, you know, just the actual, con was the last, last step to, to a really, really long path that, it, that comes more from, from here than anything else. 
in fact, um, I always think of uh, Otto Klemperer's statement when he was asked about why he didn't teach conducting. And he said, I could teach you to conduct in three minutes. One, two. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> The I gesture is the last, as you say, it's, it's it, it, in the best of cases, it's something that comes naturally. In other cases, it has to be practiced. But, you know, the main thing is to know the score, to know what's going on. And as I said before, all of the old time conductors started that way. They started in the opera house because it's the most difficult thing. It's much harder. You know, when you're doing a symphony concert, you get I would, there. I always say, what is a Mozart symphony compared to Don Giovanni? Right. I mean, two masterpieces, sure. Yeah. But, you know, uh, prepare the singers, prepare the chorus, play the recitativi, uh, sing, blah, blah, blah. Then you do a Mozart symphony, it's like, oh, you, first of all, you don't have singers. <laughs> right. Thank God. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Okay, I love singers. But you know what I mean? It, it's... Um, yeah, symphonic repertoire is a big chamber music, you know, uh, with with its challenges, of course, um, and I love it. I'm I'm here doing a symphonic uh, program for for Juilliard. Um, but of course, doing opera and doing it well is very challenging. And, and having those 15, 16 years of experience behind the scenes gives you a a plus that is um, invaluable, I think. Invaluable. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, all of the old timers from Bruno Walter and Klemper, who were assistants to Gustav Mahler, and, uh, you know, uh, George Schulte and Eric Leinsdorf, who were assistants to Toscanini, et cetera, et cetera. They all uh, work their way up that way. Nowadays, we have a lot of conductors who start with symphonic music. And when they have to do opera, they're not quite sure how to cope with it. Um, before we go on with our conversation, I've picked out a few um, uh, little video clips of Speranza. Um, and uh, let's watch one of them. Uh, the first one is a fairly recent one. It's the intermezzo from Manon Lescaut in uh, Liège, Belgium, where she is now principal conductor. So we can have a look at that. Sound, I need the sound. I look pretty, but I need the sound.
Chin is a genius. Mm -hmm. But it has to be done properly. <laughs> yeah. it, can, it can get vulgarized so much. Right. And he's refined. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, how, uh, when did you make your debut with uh, Valoni? The, the that was the uh, last March 2017. I did Jerusalem by Verdi, which is an opera which is rarely done. It's the remaking of Il Lombardia la Prima Crociata in French. He revised the whole opera and added ballet music, uh, arias and scenes that are completely not in the Lombardi. And I find Jerusalem to be a, a real masterpiece. In fact, the whole opera is on, you, on, uh, on YouTube. You can find it. We're going to see a, a bit of that yeah. a little later. Okay. But it's, it's an opera de Verdi that no one knows and it's really glorious music. So. Um. Talk a little bit more about uh, how you now, as a conductor, prepare singers when you're working yeah. on an opera. Well, you know, <clears throat> for me, as I said, conducting was the next step. But uh, for m especially when I do opera, I cannot separate the repetitor in me, uh, so to speak, because actually, uh, doing opera for a conductor, there's a great verb in Italian, which is concertare. Uh, I don't know how you would sort of translate that. To, uh, to make a concerted effort. It, it, means, it means basically what you're doing is you're starting from here and you're adding bricks to the building. So you start, the first thing you have to do is you have to get in a room at the piano with the singers. And you're going to work on that and decide the tempi, the phrasing, how you're going to pronounce. what, And, and that kind of work... Um, Usually in a, in a good setting, for example, here in Liege, where I'm music director, I always impose to have at least two or three days of just music, which means that before you even see the orchestra, the director should always be present also of the show. And that's where you decide, stage director, stage director you decide uh, characters and, you know, and m many times um, I sit at the piano myself and do it. I mean, there's a rehearsal pianist, which is what I used to do. But then uh, many times, all y you just need to actually be there and play it with the singers. And that's where you discover what that singer can do, cannot do. Maybe you've planned a tempo in your head, and then you get a singer who can't do that tempo or who feels more comfortable in another tempo. Uh, you, like yesterday, I met the singer for the, for the concert I'm doing uh, on, on Thursday, and she's singing this Beethoven aria. And we sat at the piano and we decided, it, and I had picked a tempo for the slow part, which was a little more andante, and she wanted it a little more. So you find compromises, you know. Um, once you've done that, you get with, together with the orchestra already knowing where that singer is going to breathe, what they're going to do. And then, and then so you, you read the music with the musicians, explaining to them also 
what the singer is saying that moment. Ideally, you also sing the part as you conduct, which I do all the time with my beautiful vibrato. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all again, the, the uh, conductors, the, the serious opera conductors of the past used to, when they would rehearse the orchestra, not sing all the words, but they would sing the key yeah, and, parts and, you to You know, the if, you're, if you're in, for example, I was recently in Rome uh, and I did La Sonnambula. If you're an Italian orchestra and you're singing the words, of course, they understand. But I was recently in Ufa, which is in the south of Russia, with an orchestra, symphonic orchestra who'd never done opera, we did a huge gala of arias and duets. And, and of course, they don't understand a word, but just the way you sing and you, and you show them the phrase. Uh, I had a translator there. She never even translated anything because music can speak for itself. And if you sing as a conductor, you, you show them how the phrase goes. I, I, I literally, in one day, I have to say, I, I transformed them, you know, and they, they you could tell that even if they didn't understand the words, they, they knew what it was about. Right. They got the basic feeling. I, you ask about uh, concertare. You know, in the, in the 19th century in Italy, they used to have two different jobs. They said the maestro concertatore, who would prepare everything, and then the direttore d'orchestra, who was somebody a little more famous, who would come in at the last minute. But many minute. times on the posters you see uh, direttore e concertatore, e maestro, one right. person. Right, yes. right. Uh, fortunately, that, that became one person's job instead of two different people. Yeah, and, and, and of course, you, the same thing is for the chorus. That's the other big element of opera is chorus usually. So uh, you do the same thing. You go in with the piano and you work with the chorus on phrasing and breathing and, and then you put it all together and ultimately you get into the pit on stage and all the puzzle starts to get together. You hope. One hopes, <laughs> not always, but so there's always a missing piece of the puzzle, right. but then somehow miraculously opening night comes and everything gets together. Mm -hmm. Let's watch another uh, segment. Um, oh, this is fun. This is um, Attila's Cabaletta from, from Attila in a recent performance yes, in, in Barcelona. Barcelona concert performance of Verdi's Attila, uh, Ildar Abrazakov, uh, the basso singing, and he did it so well that they, they made it. They asked for an encore, it. yeah. <laughs> we'll only watch it one time through, but. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
was at the uh, Teatro Liceu oh, yes. in Barcelona. Yeah. Um, you know, I was looking at the list of the various uh, places you've conducted in the last few years. The Vienna State Opera, Zurich Opera, Canadian Opera Company, Barcelona, uh, Toronto, oh, the uh, Canadian Opera Company, o Opera di Roma, Reggio di Tor Torino, Rossini Opera Festival Pesaro, Santa Fe Opera, LA Opera, Washington National Opera, Macerata, Teatro Sao Carlos in Lisbon, Finnish National Opera, and concerts uh, with various European and American orchestras. What is there a different, I mean, do you find, um, you know, I don't want to get into national characteristics, but is there a difference when you go from one place to the other? You find a different kind of uh, atmosphere when you get there, or do you are you able to create the atmosphere yourself? I think we create the atmosphere. I mean, of course, every every country has its own flavor, <laughs> uh, and that that reflects in the music making. Um, every every country has its own way of being. Um, you know, I, I was just recently in Tokyo uh, to do a, a concert. I left out Tokyo. Tokyo, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and China. And, for example, Tokyo and China. Okay, you think Asia, right? So, I in China, I went to the Shanghai Symphony and amazing orchestra. And, and you got the feeling, you know, when you're rehearsing, you create the energy, and then you stop and people start talking and, and a little bit more kind of... No, I wouldn't say undisciplined, but a uh, little more, you know, Tokyo, you stop, no fly goes, you know. It's incredible, the, the, the discipline and the, oh, the, God, the, the way they play, it's just, you know, in two rehearsals you're able to put up a program because all you have to do is shape the music and they can do it and they do it. Um, one, one funny thing that I always like to, to, to note, there's a difference, for example, between Tokyo and Rome, let's just say. <laughs> For example, there you have, let's say, two hour and a half rehearsal, and you're so satisfied, everything's going really well, you, you, you finish early, right? It happens. So you say, okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, we're done, we'll see you tomorrow. Usually in, in Rome or in many places, not just, not just Rome, but even in France, I would say, you say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're the, the, you're, not even said done, and it, you know, like, like the cockroaches, you know, <laughs> they're all out of the door. There, not only do they stay, but they stay and practice till the end of the session. So it's, it's interesting for me to, to, to notice all these things. These are just little anec anecdotes, but I would say when it comes to the music making, uh, as I said before, it's such an international language music that um, it's us, the conductors, that create the, the atmosphere. Um, and, and it's through, through what we say to the, to the players. Like this, this Attila, for example. Attila is an... Uh, uh, now people perform it more. Maestro Muti did it here at the Met. Um, but you see early video and you think, oh my god. And instead, then you, 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 you work with the players and you, and you create the atmosphere of that particular aria in a certain way. And, and, and they, they just, you, there's this beauty with conducting that you can really transform something into something else, uh, which I, thought, I find fascinating. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, talking about uh, the Italian orchestras. When I used to observe rehearsals at La Scala, when Abado was the conductor there, and the orchestra, anytime anybody stopped mm -hmm. for any reason, there would be all this noise in the <laughs> orchestra, everybody talking at once. I just say, I was in right. ju just in Rome at my Teatro dell'Opera, which is the theater where I saw my first opera, and we did Sonambula. They were very, very quiet, very disciplined, uh, because um, it really depends on what the energy the conductor uh, sets from the first rehearsal. And if, you're, if you are able to convey seriousness and playfulness, but mostly that you know what you're talking about, then every musician wants to be good, finally. Like, no one wants to play badly, you know? So, yeah, we're more colorful, more loud people, but to, it, when it comes to the, to the substance, you know, we deliver, and that's, that's ultimately what counts. Yeah, well, Abado's technique was to start off, Signori, 
and the noise wouldn't abate. Signori, he'd say a little softer. Signori, signori. When they couldn't hear him anymore, they would stop <laughs> talking. That's very <laughs> that funny. Was his technique for. Um, so, but speaking about uh, the discipline of the orchestra, have you ever had trouble as a woman conductor, uh, you know, dealing with uh, largely male bodies of instrumentalists? <laughs> First of all, there's so many women in orchestras right, today. Now, yeah. uh, some orchestras are more women populated. Um, no, I, I have not had that problem. And when you have problems of discipline, and that can happen, uh, you never know if it's related to that factor or simply, you know, that those people are just used to being undisciplined. Um, I, I've never encountered people that made me feel like uncomfortable because of, of who I am, you know. Um, mostly because I think that once you're in front of those 80 people or 200 if you have a chorus, at the end of the day, if, if you know what you're doing, they know that you know what you're doing and that's that's the most relevant part. Uh, we, this kind of um, question is nearly never uh, posed, let's say, done, for example, to instrumentalists. You know, do um, you have a problem because you're a woman playing the violin? No. You know, of course, you know, um, a lot of the barriers have come down, and that I think is really wonderful. And there's so many talented, great women out there doing this that I think, um, as I always say, I repeat myself a lot, but I really believe it. It's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. Girls growing up today see women conducting, so it's totally normal for them to, to see this as a job that anyone can do. It's the music that speaks ultimately. How about, this is a question that interests me, you know, uh, German-Austrian orchestras very often play after the beat. Mm -hmm and American orchestras, Italian orchestras generally play with the conductor's beat. Is that, uh, do you find that problematic at all? Um, I like on the beat, by the way. Uh, right. Just today with the Juilliard Orchestra, we, we were talking about that. Um, because the timpani or the brass was slightly late and I, I was like, you know, you need to be on the beat. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to just say a little incident that happened to me. I, about three years ago, Ildar called me um, short notice and said, Speranza, where are you? I said, I, I'm at home studying. He said, well, uh, Gergiev canceled Attila at the Marinsky. Uh, I had never conducted Attila at that point. I had played it uh, several times, including the production at the Met. I was the pianist for that and assisted, assisted Muti on that. And he said, uh, you know, before they engage some conductor they've never seen, at least I know that you know the score and you know it the way I want it because you prepared me for that role. Um, and so, would you come? And I said, well, when is it? She said, in five days. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, so I, 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 I took two seconds and I thought, okay, I'll do it. That's life, you know. You Where? Just, at the Marinsky. Oh, at the Marinsky. Yeah, in St. Petersburg. So they, they hastily got me, got me the visa, I, I got the orchestral score, I replayed the whole you know, thing and I then studied the score overnight and I went there. Of course there was no rehearsal. So you just jump in the show, one hour before you have a rehearsal, for about an hour, to warm up the orchestra. <laughs> and I, st I start the prelude, you know, and I go. Uh, I'm like, oh, oh, it's gonna be a long night. Because <laughs> literally, like, you just go, Duh. and there's nothing you can do because you have no rehearsal. So, so it, it's challenging. I, I find it uh, very difficult I, if that happens. But in a normal setting, if you had a rehearsal, then you would just stop and say, Signore, Signore, per favore, con me. <laughs> Except it doesn't look, Scholte told me many years ago, he said, uh, I, I once told the Vienna Philharmonic, I can't do this, you always play after the beat, you have to please play with me on the beat. And he said, so we made a Viennese compromise, they played after the beat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've conducted in Vienna, so. Yeah, in Vienna they play on the beat when it comes, at least... Um, 
in opera. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but even when we did the Wiener, the, the ball, you know, they, they, I think they're used to so many different conductors right. wanting different things. So, yeah. And if you're doing Rossini, I'm sorry, how can you do that after the beat? Right. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Maybe that would be Mahler. Challenging. Mahler, Mahler yes, you can, Anyone can get away with Mahler. <laughs> you know, just beat time and right. something. And let them do but their... But Rossini, right. uh, not so much. Do you have the clip of that? No, you don't. <laughs> no. Uh, the next clip I have, in fact, is, I think, the Così fan tutte in Rome. In Rome. It's a little... Uh, interview. Inter it's yeah. part interview, part, uh, part oh, music. Special. Yeah, let's, let's have a... Nel, nel Così fan tutte suonerò anche i recitativi al fortepiano, che era una prassi abbastanza usuale, diciamo, ai tempi di, di Mozart, che il direttore suonasse anche il clavicembalo o il fortepiano. E diciamo che in quest'opera i recitativi sono altrettanto importanti, tanto quanto diciamo, i numeri, numeri musicali, perché l'azione la, vera e propria avviene nel recitativo e io spesso, se posso, cerco di, di suonarli perché danno un'unità a tutta l'opera. E le due coppie di amanti sono all'inizio dell'opera Dorabella con Ferrando, quindi mezzo soprano tenore, e Fior di Ligi Guglielmo, cioè soprano eh, baritono basso. E subito dopo c'è questo cambio di, diciamo, di coppie. E quindi poi c'è lo scambio per cui il tenore finisce col soprano e il mezzo soprano con il baritono. E diciamo che a livello musicale questo, questo tipo di accoppiamento di timbri delle voci è più classico, il soprano col tenore e il mezzo soprano col baritro. C'è tutto un gioco anche lì di scambio, le coppie si scambiano, anche la musica accompagna questo, questo scambio di coppie e poi alla fine quando gli amanti tornano e tornano con i loro diciamo, nomi originali è tutto un po' c'è una confusione totale verso la, verso la fine. I was so sick there. You can see my raccoon eyes. Seriously, I was I had like fever the whole time. Wow, but I survived. You survived. And seeing uh, just now seeing the name of of uh, Graham Vick, the the stage director. Uh, the uh, vexato vexata question, <laughs> you know, how do we cope? How do conductors cope these days with stage directors who may have ideas that do not jibe with uh, the musical yeah. ideas. My take is, is, I don't mind modern. In fact, I like it. This was a very modern production. Um, and Graham Vick, for example, just to bring up a name, speaks fluent Italian, reads music, can sing all the parts. He's very prepared. Amazing, amazing knowledge of the score. Great theatrical mind. So you have to respect that because, you know, even if he'll do something controversial, it comes from a standpoint of knowledge. Um, what is very disturbing is when you're in front of a direct stage director who doesn't have all of that and creates something weird just to do something weird. Um, so that's where, where the fine line is. And there's always a way to compromise with stage directors between stage directors and conductors. For example, I always find it very uh, important, and I try to do that, to be present from the beginning of the rehearsals. 
Viscosif and Tutte was uh, eight weeks of rehearsals, imagine. I mean, eight weeks between the rehearsals and the shows. And because we had two casts. And um, if you're present at every staging rehearsal, then you're there and you can discuss things and you can, if you're in front of an intelligent uh, person, there's way you can ways you can always find a way to you know. Um, of course, for me, the the most important thing is that the music should never be butchered, or 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 violated. You know what I mean? Um, I just recently got from a theater I won't say where a list of possible cuts, and um, some of them were okay, some were one. But the thing that disturbed me most that was that in some of the recitativi all of a sudden on the list, uh, some of the words were, had been changed. And I'm thinking, uh, Senor da Ponte, he kind of knew what he was doing, you know? So uh, do your thing, change, do something, uh, but don't change the text, you know? And if you need to change the text to accommodate your idea, then something's wrong, you know? But that doesn't mean that you can't make things act Actual, you know, like attuale, come si dice? Contemporary. Opera has to speak to the contemporary man. So uh, it's fantastic when you can, you know, see people dressed up in normal clothes and make it speak to us, but in, in a smart and intelligent way. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this, this can be a problem, the changing words. And I remember quite a while ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, here at City Opera, before it fell apart. <laughs> uh, I remember a production of uh, Rigoletto with, uh, that um, Jonathan Miller had staged. And it was staged in the, somewhere in the American Southwest. No, it wasn't Rigoletto, it was uh, L'Elisir d'Amore, actually. It was in the American Southwest, and there was a jukebox and everything else. And of course, there were super titles in English, and there uh, changed all the words. The, the, the translation. English, the translation was changed. So when uh, Belcore says "come pari de vezzoso," it said like Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, something <laughs> like that. And, you know, but the other thing is that, <laughs> hello, people have ears. They're going to hear that they're not saying those names. Right. I mean, so. Yeah. And also when the situation is totally inapplicable yeah. to, uh, anyway, this yeah. is a whole other... Uh <laughs> yeah. There's very, very <coughs> extremely intelligent ways where you can make something contemporary, make it different, make it modern, but not uh, change the sense of the music or the words. Mm. Of course, then there are operas that were written in three days by composers where they themselves would change the aria, change the recitativo. Um, Take one from one opera yeah, and stick it into even a different Even Così fan tutte, which is a masterpiece, uh, Mozart put in uh, several cuts that can be done, right. that he suggested himself. And we know that at the time of Mozart, people would sit in the theater and eat, talk, uh, do all sorts of things that we don't want to talk about <laughs> in in the um, you know palki mm, the boxes, in the boxes yeah. all sorts of things happen you know and so you know sometimes you have these recitativi that go on and on between the spina fiordiligi they always say the same stuff in a very poetic highly written Italian but you know sometimes people just missed part of it and like peeking through or oh, what are these oh, okay, okay so if even if you cut some of that it's not murder you know no. but there's ways to do it that I think has to still be respectful for the composer. For me, the composer has to come always first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were also, they would cut cabalettas in Verdi's si. operas and, and he condoned some of it sometimes yeah. under certain circumstances. And of course it was a different culture because then audiences wanted to hear new works, mm -hmm. especially through the 19th century. They were not interested in hearing old stuff that's a 20th century development, and so it was a living, a living organism, in a way. Um, I would like now to ask you in the uh, audience if you have any questions you would like to pose, and we're gonna watch one more thing as well. So, but please, go ahead.
actually started conducting pretty late in my life. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> although, she's, she's although you 23. Although you can look it up, so it's fine. No, no, no. What I, what I mean is that it, it's an interesting question because through my studies and even when I was a repetitor, many singers and directors mostly that I worked with as pianists and we're suggesting, well, why don't you conduct? You have, you have it. Like we can see that you're a leader. That you, the way you play the piano, it's obvious that you should be leading. And, and this, this subject came up several times in my 30s and uh, early 30s. And I didn't feel confident enough because I felt like I didn't know enough. Still, not enough about music. And at that point, I had been studying already 30 years of my life. And, and and this had nothing to do with the fact that I'm a woman, uh, because women were already conducting. It, it was just a sense of, I'm not ready yet. And and then the time came when I felt, now I'm ready, you know, because, as I said before, um, without all of that heritage, you know, that that we call it in Italian gavetta, which here, you know, what do you say? It's like the dirty work, you know, that you have to do. You, I would never felt comfortable getting up there and doing it. No, but that's very good. That's a good question. Of course, you have to leave, uh, the, the, the fine line is that the artist who's in front of you is an artist. Mm -hmm. It's not some machine that you just, you know, push the button, sing me la donna mobile. Okay, so everyone is different. So I think that within the respect of the composer, you can leave, let the singer have certain li liberties of interpretation. Otherwise, we become just photocopies of each other. You just saw this Attila, no? Verdi. Um, Verdi wrote that last note for about three bars. Ta -ta -ti -ta -ti. And then the orchestra goes, ta -ta -ta -tum, bum, bum, bum. right? So if we want to be really fiscal, you would have to cut the bass and say, okay, now you stop singing and it's me ending the aria. But there are some moments in opera when it's live where if the note is written by the composer, and that note is written by the composer, and you have Ildara Brazakov singing, not uh, Pinco Pallino, uh, then you say, <laughs> Pinco Pallo, no? Uh, uh, sure, hold it, because it's glorious, you know. The important thing is that it doesn't offend the music. What's wrong is when people add things that are not written, that are out of style, and just to do, just, to, you know, prove that, you know, something. Uh, but within the frame of, of, of what the composer wants, and especially if you're not violating the harmony. Um, does, that, does that answer? Yeah. There's also, uh, just to add to that, doing exactly what the composer wants. Well, we never okay. know we know no, exactly. Really know. Not only that, but the composer didn't always know exactly what he or she wanted. So. You can hear, now that we have recordings that date back a hundred years and more, uh, if you listen to two different Stravinsky performances of his own works, they're different. That's him conducting his own works. So, you know, uh, no, so everything li changes. Live theater, live concert is one thing. Recording is already a different thing. If I was recording Attila, I would not, not let him do that. But in, in a heated situation, in... Liceo in Barcelona, the audience going crazy, you know. It's the corrida. <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I don't mean to bring it down to that, but 
because it should never, you know. But you see what I mean? Um, so there is there is a fine line, and what the composer writes is all we can do, as you said. We don't have the composer to ask him or her, but we do have the printed page, and it's up to us to interpret what the printed page says and why it says that. And it, and if you have, I think the new generation of, of some conductors and also especially singers are more open to that kind of work rather than here I am, I'm this big tenor, I'm gonna shoot all my high notes and you just follow me. Th I think that part is nearly over, uh, that, that, that era. That's because we're all different. Thank God. Yeah, yeah see. Of course, you have to you have to collaborate with the singer. You cannot. There is no such thing as imposing something. There is collaborating, which means this is what I think the composer says. What do you have to offer? And then we get to a compromise. Yeah. First, first question, I have to say I, I feel very lucky that I met Maestro Muti because for me he's a living legend and probably one of the greatest conductors alive, if not the greatest. Um, he's an immense musician um, and it, you know we met by chance because I was at the Staatsoper in Vienna and I got assigned to do Le Nozze di Figaro with Maestro Muti by chance, and and they said you you will also play the forte piano, you know the recitativi, and that encounter was was like, um, you know, when you meet someone and you think, uh, I I don't want to say that I think music like him because he's <laughs> he he's a god, you know, but uh, but it was like something clicked musically, and um, and therefore after that I collaborated eight years with him which was his choice, you know, and I felt very blessed by that. And I think that the greatest lesson I got from him was just watching him work, whether it was a symphony or, or an opera or the way he worked with, pia with, uh, with singers at the piano was a school of, of itself. A lot of people think, oh, I have to take a lesson with this person to learn how to conduct or I have to, uh, you know, do a master class. <sighs> There's no master class that can um, substitute for, for uh, you know, eight years of just being there. You absorb things, uh, ways of, of talking, ways of, you know. So that, I would say that's the greatest lesson was the whole, the whole experience. Um, a lot also in the symphonic because, you know, when I would be around the world doing an opera with Maestro, he would also do concerts like here in New York. Uh, and, and I would go to all the rehearsals, and then you, you learn symphonic repertoire. So, what was the second question? Uh, ah, yeah. First of all, I love the human voice. I think that it's the greatest instrument there is. Imagine, you, when you play the piano or you play the cello, there's an external instrument, physically, that, you know, the human voice is just here, you know. And imagine how delicate that is and what kind of psychology you have to have when you work with singers because their instrument is inside of them and it's something that is fragile. We think of singers as these great, you know, divas and divos and, and, and you know, a, a cold for them is the end of a day, you know, <laughs> of our performance. So. The biggest challenge is I never had problems with singers because I have a very open personality and I'm a very adaptable person. But the greatest thing that you have to keep in mind when you're working with singers is that you have in front of you someone who's creating sounds out, out of their body. So you need to encourage them. You need to always find ways to work with them where if there's something that's not working, you, you should never say, say it in a way that it's... because. 
because then the instrument shuts up and they just <laughs> that's the end, you know what I mean? So um, I, I, um, I think that's, I think that to work well with singers, you have to be a very, very, very good psychologist in the sense that you have to have good, good sense of you know, the human side of things. I was told when I was young, I did a certain amount of that kind of work also. And uh, I was told by somebody with a lot of experience, you always start off by saying, that was perfect. <laughs> but. Now, just a little <laughs> detail about the way you pronounce that, and then you go into all the detail, and you know, but you start off saying, that was really great. Yeah. You know, whether it was terrible or m medium or, or great. You yeah. know, there's always but something. That yeah, I mean, th th that's very funny, but like, th there's a way of, of saying things, and, and mostly, I find that there's always a way that you can bring the singer on your side. It, it really depends how you, you know, I've had cases of singers where you, where you feel like they're resisting the idea that you pose to them. And slowly through the four weeks of rehearsals, strangely, you get to where you wanted to get. <laughs> so it, it, it's a very tricky thing. It's give and take. Anybody else want to ask something? Well, that, that's a very good question. Um, I think that comes again with, with very strong musical ideas. In a way, it's very rare that an instrumentalist will really not do what you're asking for if from the beginning you've, you've made sure that you've explained what your idea is. I'm just thinking, for example, of phrasing, you know? Um, like today I was doing the Italiana di Mendelssohn, no? Mendelssohn 4. The, the third movement. Um, you know, it starts very. So they were giving a big accent at the beginning. I said, "Why do you give a big accent? It's an upbeat, and and it's the beginning of a conversation. It's like the conversation has been going on in a room, and then you fi you just sneak through the room and the sound starts. You know. So I could tell at the beginning they didn't want to do it, but then when I used this image. I don't know why, but it just all came together. I just went, and then they knew. So it <laughs> depends how you, how you say things. I think also, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the age of, of the conductor being the tyrant is over also, in a way, because we live in a world of communication, of, sorry, the conductor is, of course, the, the leader, but it's also someone who, without the musician, is nothing. Right. So it's like, you have to make music with the musicians. Of course, you have to convince them of your, your ideas, and you, you will always get someone who's like, and I've had occasions where they're like, are you sure you really, wouldn't it be better to do, and, and then you think, you know, put your pride away, because that, that doesn't serve anyone. And sometimes, musicians gives, give you great ideas. Like I was just in Detroit, I did a great series of concerts and there was one specific spot that was not quite perfect. And the concert master then we were talking about it and she said, maybe if we don't do as that much Alentando could be, you know. And I thought, here's someone who's, who's done this a lot and is telling me something. And surely enough, I took her advice and then it went really well. So uh, maybe in the old days, the one would be like, Come ti permetti di dirmi una cosa del genere, capito? Eh, chi sei tu? Io sono il direttore. Tanto se fai così e poi quelli non suonano. Right. So. Oh, I've had, I've had that. At the very beginning, um, it happened just by chance that I was in a specific opera house, I won't say where. <laughs> At the concert, uh, Master was not an easy person. <laughs> but I think it, it wasn't because I was a woman. He, he just, we were doing Mozart, and he had a very Baroque, very aggressive, non-vibrato idea of Mozart. And 
I had the opposite. You know, I'm more Viennese classic, mu you know, Mozart. And um, of course, that's a difficult situation because he's the leader of the orchestra and you're the conductor and some of the musicians want to follow the, you know. Um, so, but you, you, you find ways to, to get around it and then in some situations you don't, you just swallow, you know, the pill, <laughs> the bad pill and you move on to the next gig. And then you just learn that there are people like that, you know, are unflexible, but usually that means they're not very, very good musicians because you have to be flexible as a musician. And, and ultimately, if you want to be the conductor, then you should just pick up the baton and do it yourself, right? right? Yeah, there's also... Oh, no. <laughs> there's all... <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's dangerous. No, that's... <laughs> That's very yeah. dangerous. Um, but of course, I was at the very, very beginning, and that plays a factor too. If you're new on the scene, people think that they can take more advantage. The more profile, the more you know, uh, experience you have as a conductor too, the more you know how to deal with those situations. I, I once, uh, in my long, long ago conducting days, I, uh, I still remember it was in the Mozart Lind Symphony. I asked the oboe to play something a certain way, and uh, he wanted to do it in a very fancy way. So he played it my way at the rehearsal, but in the concert he did it his <laughs> way. So, you know, they have the last word, <laughs> in, yeah, in fact. Really, you know, which is why you need to conquer them at the first rehearsal, otherwise. All right. Um, let's have, uh, is there another question? I I think that, that Juilliard is such an amazing school, and um, the the amount of talent there is, is is immeasurable. I mean, and I think that the the level of players there is as high as when I went to school. Um, it has not changed. I'm talking about orchestra now, right now. Um, I remember when I was a student, I used to go to all the orchestra concerts. I just loved going to mo most of the performances. It just fascinated me. And um, and I was always in shock at, at the l level of players there because you find yourself with people in the third row of the first violins that could be the next, you know, Joshua Bell or whatever. They are incredible soloists who, who are then in an, or in an orchestra. Um, so... Um, I, I d wouldn't say that the level has changed. I think that it's exactly th the way the way it was then. It's today, and um, yeah, I've I've enjoyed my time here this week. But also, I did two operas with the Juilliard Orchestra, and it was always very very high level. Um, um, when I said about the singers saying you should conduct, you have what I meant is that when you're playing a, a orchestral score on the piano with the singer, there's a very f fine but huge difference between accompanying a singer and leading a singer. And then there's another step, which is <laughs> give the singer the impression you're accompanying them, but you're actually leading them. So they think that they are free, but they're not. <laughs> and the way you do it is that basically, and I didn't know I had this in me until a few people told me. One of the people who told me was actually Maestro Muti. Um, and I'll tell you when he, to when he told me. If we have time, I don't know, we could stay here forever. Um, <coughs> basically, if you're, if you're sing doing an aria with a singer, first of all, you have to have a great ear and feel what the tempo that they're doing is comfortable for them 
you know, and there's a way to figure that out because you can feel the breath. And then there's a way where you can impose, by the way you play, certain things, like uh, an upbeat or, it's very subtle, I don't want to get technical into it. But from, from that, you can tell if, is, if a pianist is accompanying or leading. And I remember that when I did my first rehearsal at the Wiener Staatsoper of Le Nozze di Figaro with Maestro Muti, he didn't say much. Uh, I was terrified, of course. I was like, you know, heard horrible stories. And, and here's this man who's charming, uh, very funny, you know, and, but, you know, when he looks at you and he says, prego, suoni, you know, you're like, uh, you know. And then the second day, we had a one-to-one -one session with Barbara Frittoli, great soprano, me, me him, and, and, and Barbara, and I was at the piano, and we did the third act aria of, of Le Nozze di Figaro with the big recitativo. E Susanna non viene tiro. And Maestro never, never conducts the piano. So he was just sitting there, and he said, okay. And I'm like, okay, he's not conducting. A so Barbara starts singing, and I started playing. And then we finished the recitativo, and he looked at me, first he looked at Barbara and he said, però questa ragazza, like, well. And then he looked at me and said, hey, where did you learn this sense of theater? Senso del teatro, come si dice? Sense of, of theatricality. And I said, I don't know, maestro, I just, I didn't know what to say. And he said, no, because it's very, the way you play is very orchestral and very theatrical, which meant that I was reacting to the way she was singing certain words at the piano. At the time, I didn't quite get what he meant, but I think that's what he meant. I didn't need him to beat, beat the time. I, I already felt what the singer was doing and going with it. Does that answer your question? I think that in, in, in this world, we're all too much in a rush to do everything. Um, and as artists, you need to develop and you need, you need to take time because it's through time that you mature. And when it comes to music, there is no way someone can know everything at 25, unless you're on some sort of like... Um, yeah. But that comes once, once, you know. On, I was going to say, or Bach, you know. There you go. Uh, he's pretty good, but he, but he developed, you know. Through, Mozart was just a, a bomb, you know. Meteorite, come si dice? Meteor. But, and, and I think, I'm really convinced, not only, first of all, singers, because I work a lot with singers, there's this rush to have a career and to do it and to do it. But, you know, you have to take steps and not rush into a repertoire which is not yours just because, you know, some opera house decides to give it to you uh, or some agent pushes you to do certain things because ultimately it's your two chords and it's just you. This is for what concerns singers. When it comes to conducting, I am convinced that if you don't have the enough musical preparation, when you're out there in front of those people, you can bluff the public. You can fool people out there. Uh, the PR machines, all of that, you can fool, especially today with all the... We know some examples blah, 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 who will blah. not be named. We name, but you cannot fool the musicians in front of you. The musicians in front of you know if you know. They might not say it, they might not voice it, they might not... They say it to each other. They say it to each other, and then they say, ah, bravo, you know. But uh, if, you're, if you're fake, tra virgolette, you know, they know. And so I never wanted to be one of those people that knew that they knew. 
<laughs> because I, as a rehearsal pianist in opera houses, I've worked with practically every conductor there is on the planet, because between Vienna, the Met, Gleimborn, Chicago Opera, you name it, I've been there. And the amount of times that I was at the piano playing with someone beating time and thinking in my head, what is this idiot doing, you know? And, and of course, you can't say it. And then you're the pianist, so you save them because with your 10 fingers, you can save a conductor. Uh, so can a great orchestra. Absolutely. A great orchestra can save a bad conductor. I always say 80% of the performances you go to, the orchestra is better than the conductor. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And so, uh, th to, re res to answer your question, I think that's what held me back. Uh, I, I decided that if, if I was going to do it, I was going to do it when I felt really ready. And you never feel really ready, you know? I mean, you just never feel very ready. But, but you know that if you've done that for 10, 15, 16 years, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to conduct now, next month, my first Not City Figaro. The amount of times I've played this opera in my life, I can't, can't even count. The amount of times I've played the rest, it's even more. And I have basically, after I leave here, about a week to, to prepare it. And, but I'm not stressed because I know that I know every single note of that opera. You know, so for me, just the beating the time is not the issue. So, um, and it's the same for it not only opera, but so much of even the symphonic repertoire, because you've heard it, you know it, you know, you breathe it. So, um, as I said, you never feel completely ready, but it came a point where I felt like, now it's time to um, take this challenge. And it was a challenge, and I, I took it, and I, I think uh, I did the right thing. Because, you know, yeah. I would have right. regretted it if I right, hadn't done it. Right. There comes that moment when it's yeah, I, uh, I either a, or. I, I have to say, and uh, this is just another anecdote. I, I had signed a, a five-year contract to go to the Zurich Opera as head of the music staff, which means head of all the pianists. It's a huge position. It's like the after the music director, the most important thing there is. And two, that was two years before I debuted as a conductor. And then I made my debut, and I was like, uh-oh. Ooh. And I was, will always be grateful to the Zurich Opera, where I debuted this year as a conductor, um, for releasing me from that contract. Because it was one of those moments where I felt, okay, I have two roads, this one and that one, and this one feels so wrong, and this one feels so right. And um, just one of those moments in life. Yeah, the crossroads. I think we will end with uh, one more excerpt. Um, this is the Jerusalem, ah. Jerusalem of, of Verdi, with, uh, it's a duet with Elaine Alvarez and Ivan Tyrion okay. in Liège. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks for coming.